This episode of The Substance is brought to you by Chris Hotchkiss, American Family, and listeners like you. substance a podcast aimed at being biblical thoughtful and human join us each week as we engage the culture without the culture war i'm your host vincent edwards joined here by my friends and co-hosts my boys my homies philip marinello hey everybody and trevor aiken what's going on how y'all doing tonight? How y'all hey, feeling? What's feeling up? Right. I'm feeling better now. I was like, oh man, like I was getting ready for this tonight. I was like, I feel like garbage, but <laughs> last 20 minutes or so, sometimes I got it's nice, just a day. Sometimes I got a it's nice a little uh, pep, so I'm ready. Maybe awesome. maybe someone's coming listening here, and and it's been a day for them. And if so, you're welcome here. Come hang out. With Absolutely. Us. So if you are a returning guest, we want to say welcome back. Um, if you're a new guest, we want to say welcome. Uh, the Substance is a Christian variety show, and every week we talk for about an hour about something or a number of things in Christianity, culture, and the arts. At the end, we share some shout outs of things we or our guests have been finding enjoyable or edifying. So we welcome you to the show. Um, as you've clicked on this episode, we have on today a very special guest, uh, Dr. Felicia Wu Song. She is a professor of sociology at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, and interim chair of the sociology and anthropology department. She is a writer, a speaker, mother of two, and last but not least, uh, she is an author, including her most recent book, uh, just released November 2021, um, with IVP called Restless Devices, Recovering Personhood, Presence, and Place in the Digital Age. Welcome, Felicia, to the show. Thank you. It's so great to be with you all. That's quite a resume. What, what did you say? She was chair of anthropology what? Sociology <laughs> and anthropology department. So she, man. That's that's giving us like a nice little bump of prestige right there. I like it. Yeah, it, it's interim. It's okay. I was chair before. I'm filling in for a colleague right now. But yes. <laughs> well, we're very happy to have you, Felicia. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. It's really great to be with you guys. I've basically been going through this particular book, uh, Restless Devices, with my pastor as we just kind of do some discipleship. So I'm super geeked to have you on. Um, and and honestly, I just wanted to start with uh, just asking you about how you came to faith um, mm -hmm. and what led you to study the particular subject of the digital age and technology. So I grew up in a Christian home. My parents immigrated from Taiwan, and when they came to the United States, they converted to Christianity. Uh, so by the time I, I was born, I was going with them to um, what I've recently learned. Um, there's a word for this. It's called a Chinese Baptist church. So it's uh -huh. an ethnic yeah. church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was all Chinese immigrants. Um, and theologically, it was basically Baptist, even though it didn't have a denominational affiliation. <laughs> and so yep, I, I grew right. up in that and, um, you know, became a Christian within that context. Really wasn't someone that was particularly curious, quite frankly, as a young person. I just kind of followed what was told to me and it all kind of made sense. Um, and when I went off to college, I uh, joined InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship, cool. which was super great. Um, nice. I, I just... I grew so much and learned so much about the relationships that can be built uh, within Christian fellowship, like genuine Christian fellowship. Mm -hmm. And it was during college that I actually, uh, through a conversation with um, a friend, learned that one could actually bring one's faith into the classroom. That is, hmm. that there would, there would be a relation, could be a relationship between one's faith and what one thinks about the mind, right? The, the intellectual mm -hmm. life. And this was something that was completely foreign to me beforehand. Mm -hmm. Like it was wow. just, I had my personal pious faith over here, my classes and thinking about career over there, nothing to do with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So when I had this conversation with this friend, it was just, it just was like a light bulb 
just like burst in my head, you know, of just mm-hmm. like, really? I could start thinking about my classes from a Christian perspective and not just simply feel like the class, because I went to a secular school, is just a threat or was going to, you know, erode my faith. It was going to yes. threaten me, right? Like, I was like, whoa, sure, okay, yeah. I can actually start <laughs> thinking about this. And so by the time I left college, I was like a total late bloomer because my brain was racing then. I was like needing to catch up, you know, because I hadn't Mm -hmm. been thinking at all um, from a faith perspective. And so after college, I had a job teaching at a private school. I was a history teacher because that's I studied Mm -hmm. history as an undergrad. Um, And while I was there, and this is really going to date me because you guys are like, you're, you all are young guys, man. It was the first year that at this private school, they brought email nice. to the students. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're in the mid nineties. And it was fascinating to me because we spent a lot of time talking in this private school about relationships and community And then we brought email and we had no conversation about how email was actually going to impact all the ways that we related to each other as Mm -hmm. students, as teachers, as dorm parents Mm -hmm. and so forth. And so that got me thinking that that struck me as just being kind of strange. I was like, shouldn't we be talking about this? Shouldn't Mm -hmm. we be intentional about wondering, like, how is email going to change things for us here? Mm -hmm. And so... I started wondering about that. I stumbled upon Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Classic. uh, Yeah. And and I was like, wow, there's there's people that write about media. (laughs) Think about this stuff. Um, And I also ended up going to Labrie Fellowship, um, if you're familiar with that, up in Southboro, Massachusetts for a term. Mm-hmm. And was just in such a, a supportive environment to, to have those questions be cultivated. Right. Um, and so it became clearer during that time that I, I needed to go to grad school. Um, and I wanted to study more about how media and technology has been impacting through American history, right? Our relationships, our sense of community, our experience of identity. And I was also super interested in why it was that in American society, we don't talk about this stuff. Like we just Mm kind of take the media, we take the technology, we use it, we love it, we embrace it, but we don't really have like really substantive conversations about it Mm -hmm. Um, until I would say until kind of recently, you know, Mm -hmm. um, we've kind of started having more genuine conversations about it between each other. That's kind of my journey. You mentioned uh, Postman. I was going to ask, were there any things that you read in college or around that time that were kind of spurring things on? Or is this just natural curiosity? Like, were there other moments or or resources or books that you read that kind of got you thinking? Or was it just kind of the curiosity of you, like your observation of this is having an effect? And are we talking about this? Like, how did that kind of go for you? Yeah, I mean, it really was, it wasn't anything I had really thought about during college. Um, and I think what I was interested in college was how it is that we come to believe and think what we think. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a, as a history major, I was mainly interested in intellectual history or cultural history, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The history of ideas. Um, mm-hmm. I took a 20th century intellectual history class, and that was absolutely fascinating to me. I read a book, and this doesn't have to do with uh, media, but this was one of my most formative books. I read George Marsden's book on fundamentalism, um, Mm -hmm. and that completely blew my mind um, because it gave me context for understanding my own journey, um, what church I had grown up. Like I grew up in a Chinese church. I thought it was only just this group of Chinese immigrants. But when I read Marsden's Fundamentalism, I realized, wow, this theology that I grew up with, the culture, the Christian culture I grew up with, is actually rooted in this, you know, 20th century experience, right? That these these Americans had experienced had nothing to do with the culture that I grew up in, right? And mm, and so yeah. that really set the stage for me for thinking about, you know, how do we come to again believe what we believe? Um, assume that the world, the reality is the way that it is. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And I I think it was really at that time when I was teaching at that private school that I became interested in how media and technology do that. Um, It also helped that U2 happened to be having their their uh, famous, uh, I think their tour, that tour, um, it was called like Even Better Than the Real Thing or Achtung Baby. It was back then. And they had this great tour that was also interrogating this question of of reality and how media mm. creates a simulation of reality that we become more interested in. So there are a couple different things there. As you're studying these things about technology and and our acceptance of it, is America as a culture, do you have any sense of are we more tending to accept and embrace and just be like, oh, yeah, cool, new technology, yeah, whatever. That's That obviously is morally good. Um, obviously, <laughs> there's positive value if it's a new technology versus yeah. other cultures. Yeah. And why? So I haven't done a lot of work studying, yeah, other cultures and other societies, but I think there definitely is a history of what's called technological utopianism Mm -hmm. that is a part of the American imagination. Yeah. And that that is rooted in our, our own kind of origin story in this country, right? Like, Hey, Mm -hmm. we're, we're the new experiment. We're the ones that, that don't have the baggage that those old country, you know, European countries had Right. Yes. Sure. London had their industrial revolution and they polluted the Thames. It's all smoggy over there. But look at what we have over here in America. Right. We have mm-hmm. all these natural resources. We're the ones that can kind of like break the code. We can figure out right how to bring human progress through technology without all the downsides. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, sure. it's just part of that enlightenment imagination of we use reason, we use science, we could figure this out, right? Yeah. And we will we will bring humanity to a better place. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That exceptionalism of like yes. we're not going to hit the yeah. the Pratt falls, like that's not going to be us. Exactly. Right. Look at all those folks, they had those religious wars. We're not going to have those religious wars. We're not going <laughs> to kill each other over these things. <laughs> we're beyond that. Yeah. Um cuz we're America, we've got We've got the we've got reason, we've got enlightenment, we've got science, we've got democracy. We can we can do this. And yeah. and I think the technology, you know, and certainly a lot of the, you know, the time that the country was really coming into its own was a time of of incredible technological progress. I mean, there's just sure. like amazing things were happening, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the steam technology, railroad technology, the telegraph, all of this was like mind blowing. So yeah. it's understandable, but it's definitely wrapped up, you know, in our American identity, sense of identity um, and exceptionalism, as you said. Yeah. As a person of faith, mm-hmm. how have you seen technology or the digital age affect our practice of ecclesiology? Whoa, okay. So I think, I tend to think that in the United States, we imagine our technologies as individualized experiences, right? We think of it within the individualistic um, imagination. Hmm. And to that extent, when I think about ecclesiology and I think about how we imagine church, Mm -hmm. Um, and participation in church. The technologies, especially the media and communication technologies that we've had in the 20th century, thinking about radio, television, now the internet, Mm -hmm. their relationship with the church, it has often reinforced and shaped a fairly individualistic model in people's Mm -hmm. minds of what participation in church looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Because the media itself is merely a tool to transport a message that is individualistic, right? Um, Very Mm -hmm. often in the church, a individualistic message of salvation um, Mm -hmm. rather Mm -hmm. than one about a participation within a community, Mm -hmm. within a church life that is um, fundamentally relational. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and much larger, um, than the individual experience. I don't know if that gets at what you're striving at, but that's where my mind goes to first. Happy to go where you want to go, Vince. If I could ask Vince a follow-up to that, I've been talking with some friends recently about the metaverse and church. 
-hmm. and i think it's a lot of hype right now but Mm -hmm. you've got some people on one side saying well there's a a problem when you take community and make it virtual Mm -hmm. versus actually being with your neighbors yeah. But then there's this counter argument of, well, what about the persecuted? What about the shut-ins? What about, you know, all these things? So I just wonder mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on the the church in metaverse world yeah. and uh, what could be the potential dangers there Yeah, or benefits. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that conversation about the metaverse church is the same conversation as pandemic church, which is the same conversation as the virtual church that folks were talking about when SimCity started, you know, like back in the day, (laughs) Um, like virtual church has been a very alluring idea, I think, for a couple decades now. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. been interesting to actually be going through this pandemic, you know, for two going on two years now, where, um, (laughs) oh, man, yeah, right. We've all kind of just been forced into a situation where like, okay, we're trying to make this work. And there's this digital resource here, which in many ways is a is, is a true gift you know i mean it's it's amazing that we can mm-hmm. still gather in certain ways for me what's mo- more interesting rather than kind of thinking about well what would the virtual church look like is is actually asking the question well what makes embodied church necessary mm. what is it about the quote unquote old fashioned way of doing things, right? <laughs> like gathering people together. What was in that practice that made being together actually essential? Mm-hmm. And and what makes me ask this is because, you know, my students now are saying, hey, I don't really see why I need to go back to the local church. There's all these great YouTube programs, YouTube wow. worship mm-hmm. services I can go to. Yeah. Right. Great preaching. Great podcast like this one I can listen to. Right. Um, hey. Like, why do I need to go to church? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a real question. A lot of people don't engage that. They just like tweet angrily, like you're wrong <laughs> and not really address like the human things that are at the heart of that question. Yeah. Yes. Right. Because for many of them, they go to church, they sit, they watch. Yeah. They sing. They consume. They're individualistic exactly. consumers. So like, right. why can't I we've consume individualistically online? Yes. Like, what's the difference? So, so like, we've already right. made church virtual just yes. in a seat with walls. Yes, exactly. And so for me, the question is like, well, we've actually hit this really interesting point in our church, local church life, where we, we actually have to ask this question. What are we doing on Sunday mornings? Yep. That actually draws people here, right? Where they're mm. like, oh, I don't need to just like that, where they would feel loss, right? If they were just watching it on YouTube, like, what are we doing in person? Not even just to draw people in to like increase the size, but like to no, be no. faithful. No, no, exactly. I feel like theology of place keeps coming up mm. just because that's a big issue now that we face, <laughs> yes. partially because of digital ubiquity. Yeah partially because yes. of COVID, partially because of like the identity crisis mm-hmm. that has been brewing like in especially like the evangelical type church where people are like, well, I believe these things, but like a lot of the other things with the packaging of these churches, I don't really feel like fit me anymore. And mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to go to like a universalist church. So what do I even do? Like mm-hmm. if I can't find a church who's like, whose people I want to associate with, like, what do I even do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've been hearing about these uh this new church movement. I don't I can't remember what it's called, but it's these churches that eat together. Mm. Not just that they do worship service and then they have lunch together, you know, in the basement, not that kind of thing, but like mm-hmm. church is actually eating together. Interesting. Like, that's church. Like their liturgy is Yeah, yeah. A right. Meal. Like yes. And I find that That's really interesting, interesting right? Yeah. Um, because it, it it builds in exactly these these issues of embodiment, of place, mm-hmm. of even communion in a in a like visceral way, right? Like we are eating together, sure, right? right. Um, and I I just find that model to be really 
um, I don't know, it just spurs my imagination, you know, in, in kind of fun ways to think like, what could we be doing? Um, and, and I totally agree. It's not about filling the pews, right? It's just like, what makes it worthwhile for anyone mm-hmm. to get up and go and hang out with these people? And what, what commitments are we really trying to live into mm-hmm. by being a community that would be genuinely invitational mm-hmm. that way, where, where someone would be like, oh, I want to go on Sunday because it's actually refreshing, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. genuinely refreshing after everything I've been through these six days, you know? Yeah. Like I really want to just go to be completely who I am um, and be welcomed there. Yeah. It's like Acts, you know, where it talks about they all held the community there in high respect. And it was like, there was mm-hmm. so many, there was a ton of people joining, but there was also the people who didn't dare join, even though they had that high respect and saw it because they knew, oh, well, that's a commitment that I'm just, it's, yeah, it's things that's will be not required. where I'm at. If I join, like, I mean, essentially, like, there's accountability. Like, I have to, my life will have requirements on it. But it wasn't yeah. like, oh, they stayed away because, like, those folks are whack over there and they're mean to each other, <laughs> you know, like that's not what it says. <laughs> if there's a high standard. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd love to hear Felicia before we get into any of the specific points of the book, what, um, what became the book, something you were already researching and writing and did IVP reach out to you? Yeah. Um, you know, the books, quite frankly, it's been on my mind for a long time <laughs> and, and, and there's ways in which, um, if I had my druthers, that book would have, this book would have come out three years earlier, but life is life. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just been a burden on my heart, really, Mm -hmm. to be Mm -hmm. bringing the sociology and the theology together. I just felt like there's a combination, like there's, there's lots of good philosophies of technology, theologies of technology books that are out there. Great folks talking about that stuff. But I just felt like there's something about sociology that diagnoses the problem that we're living in that mm-hmm. is unique and helpful, that mm-hmm. would be just practical for people's lives um, to, be, to, to have. And pairing that with a theologically informed prescription, that there's something about that combination that I've, I've just been wanting to to write on since I started grad school, right? And in a lot of ways, that's, that's why I got into what I, you know, the career that I, that I have now um, mm-hmm. is to really try to equip people with helpful tools, ways of imagining that might be different from kind of what we tend to get in our day-to-day um, that would bring some kind of hope. Um, because I think um, I've just been in too many conversations with all sorts of people who are just like, I don't know how to stop this thing. Mm-hmm. My life is mm-hmm. so deep, so driven by the technological demands. I can't stop. I don't know how to get out of this. There's a deep kind of despair, right, that mm-hmm. I've yeah. borne witness to over and over again, whether it's about themselves or about their kids, their spouse. Um, whatever it is, it just felt like, man, we got to bring this conversation into the church, you know, and so in many ways, the book is written with the hopes that church leaders would find it helpful. Mm -hmm. But I like how you kind of sell that in the subtitle too, like recovering personhood Mm -hmm. presence in place. Like Mm -hmm. we all know subconsciously, if not clearly that there's something that we've kind of lost or are losing. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I like how you kind of put that out front Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, IVP was helpful with that one. (laughs) So, uh, so yeah, they they helped me on the cover and the title. So props to them for all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another incredible cover. Shout out to the cover designer. I always Mm -hmm. forget his name, but I tag him. IVP is always crushing it with those book covers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I read in the first chapter that you talk about how we presume that technology's nature Mm -hmm. is neutral or virtually neutral. Like it's just a tool that people use. And if it has a negative effect, then, you know, that means somebody's using it improperly. Mm -hmm. Discuss that with us Mm -hmm. about how that can be true in some sense. 
Um, but it's also a misunderstanding of technology's mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's much more helpful and productive to think of technologies as artifacts of society. Mm-hmm. And, and so if we situate it that way, technology is an artifact of society, then we can grab onto the fact that, hey, if it's an artifact, that means someone built it, someone created mm-hmm. it. And that someone is a human being with particular values, a particular vision of what it means to be human, of what the good life is, mm-hmm. that they intentionally or unintentionally designed into that product, that artifact, right? Whether right. they knew it or not, they embedded just these assumptions these values, yeah. about what would mm-hmm. make life better for someone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that if we understand that, um, then we need to ask, okay, well, well, so who are the producers? So who are the designers? Who are the engineers? What assumptions are they bringing to the table when they created this platform, this device? And then for us as users, I think it's super important to, again, recognize how we are all embedded in a society that finds meaning through, again, visions of the good life, visions of what it means to be human. We use our technologies to build meaning, Mm -hmm. to be productive, to gain Mm -hmm. significance, whatever it might be. That's a big selling point. That's that's how we justify them to ourselves most often. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so so if we're going to think about, well, what's the effect of technology? I think it's much more productive to actually take into account all these other facets, not just the individual user who may be using it for good or for ill, right? Certainly that may be the case, but that there are all these other factors in, in the production, in the ways that even apart from the engineer, you have these corporations, you know, whether it's Facebook or Google, right, that have their goals, they have goals, and they have ends Mm -hmm. that they're trying to meet, um, (laughs) that are then interfacing with our, you know, in in this society, you know, the the American imagination, the American Mm -hmm. cultural values um, that are all at play um, when we're when we're using our, our devices. Man, that's solid. One of the things that, that stuck out to me, I was listening to the audiobook and taking notes on my phone, very technological <laughs> experience with my uh, issue with the book, but I, I liked how you you talked about the difference between technology being alluring to various aspects and desires of our humanity versus satisfying. And I found that mm. a very helpful paradigm mm. because it's easy and I don't think entirely wrong to go, okay, like, I, I need a minute of rest. Like I want to blow off steam or I'm going to watch a funny video or mm-hmm. I'm going to go check my favorite Twitter feed to see if there's anything interesting or, or thought provoking or funny or whatever. But talk to us about the dichotomy of alluring versus mm-hmm. satisfying. So I think the alluring part of our devices is something that the corporations and businesses that, that are, promoting these devices and services are all about. This is what they specialize in. (laughs) They have experts and researchers that understand the psychology. They understand what's going on in our brains. They understand what colors the buttons need to be so that we're going to be like, Ooh, I want to press that blue button or that red button. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, and so they've created these incredibly brilliant platforms that understand these sorts of base appetites and desires that we have as human beings and, and how, as, as one scholar puts it, you know, social media is like chips, you know, like we just want to eat the chips just cause you know, we're mm-hmm. feeling kind of munchy. You know? yeah. <laughs> we don't even know why we're eating it. We're just like, I want a little munchy. Yeah. If we're not even hungry. Really, yeah, sure. Right. We're just like, we're just like pounding. Just the need chips. to doom scroll right now. That's right. Yeah, this is, yeah. this is nice enough. So yeah. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. The chips, the bag is here. That's right. Right. Um, and so, so the devices and the services are built to, to meet those appetites and those desires. Mm-hmm. But the thing is we all, after we've, especially we've all had that experience where we spend a whole night 
you know, just like doing whatever it is that we do, you know, whether it's your gaming or you're shopping for shoes or you're doom scrolling, like whatever your thing is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then after those two hours, you're like, I, I, what was I just doing? You know, like, Mm. why did I just spend those two hours doing that? I do not know. Yeah. That reminds me of uh, the time of Vine when it's like, it's literally just a six second video. (laughs) And I catch myself just like, like, like three 10 seconds, hours 10 seconds. Oh, yeah. on six second videos that that <laughs> broke me it, it, was, it was so convicting uh i didn't mean to cut you off there but it, no, it no. just reminds me of that yeah. phenomenon of just being able yeah. to Talk, watch man. something and it's less than a minute it's literally yeah. less than a minute and it's designed that way I like, guess yeah, just a minute. Mm-hmm. Right, Not exactly. thinking, this is two and a half hours of one minute <laughs> but i'm just taking a minute and a minute yeah, yeah. And you convince yourself that it's just, I'm just going to watch a couple of videos and they're six seconds. So it's not going to take me much time to watch a few videos. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, it's evening and it's like, what have I been doing all day? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's where like for me, and I don't know exactly if this is a dichotomy you're, you were thinking of, but I actually, I think about how we kind of have like our lesser selves and our better selves you know? Sure. Hmm. And I think of like the lesser self is the self that's going to just like eat that whole bag of Doritos or spend those two hours, you know, scrolling um, on whatever it is. And the the better self is the one that says, wait a second, you know, when I look back in my life, I don't want to look and see a whole, you know, trail of Friday nights that were just demolished by eating chips and watching videos that really didn't matter in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. Like when I look back in my life, I want to see some Friday nights that were actually like, I had a good time spending it with my friends or I was creating music or, you know, like I was doing something that was meaningful. Yeah. The personhood presence in place, like that you were engaging your your true self. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the thing about the digital that that worries me is that it so easily mutes us down to our mm. lesser selves right like it fills us it fills that lesser self appetite so easily cuz it's easy mm. Mm. and so often the things that are satisfying <laughs> take work you know i mean and work might mm. even just oh, look man. like going over to that side of the room and picking up the guitar and actually playing it right yeah. um instead of just watching videos which is so much easier yeah. um like the the margin is actually very small um like the the work but i think we all know when we do devote ourselves to the work quote unquote of creating something of actually knocking on someone's door and be like, Hey, you want to go get coffee? You know, like Mm -hmm. instead of just texting, right. Um, let's go do something together. Um, that kind of work leads to something that's, that's deeply satisfying, um, in a way that we can easily forget, you know, we can, we can Mm -hmm. forget that it's there. I think that's such a good paradigm that you're laying out right there between like the baser self, the more appetite driven self versus the higher value, the pursuit of transcendence, whether that's friendship and, and other great things. And this word that you've landed on here of work kind of being the differentiator, not, not that it has to be even that much and not that it's not fun, but, but the energy there. And earlier you were mentioning that these artifacts, these these technological artifacts that people create are not created in a vacuum, but as part of a system. And what I'm thinking about is how 40 years ago, techno-utopianism, like you're talking about, it was like, everybody's going to have a 20-hour work week and all this stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> it seems like instead, the technology is actually used it's like a juicer, like it's extracting Mm. us just better and better and better. And so at the end of the day, I feel extracted, you know, by this system. And so then when it, when I think about that work to read a book, to play the guitar, to pick it up, 
I feel like I've already been so extracted else like through just even yeah. all of my yeah that you're my normal life for putting bread on the table whatever mm-hmm. it yeah. wasn't that it was physical labor necessarily I'm not physically yeah. tired but I just feel techno I don't know spiritually emotionally mm-hmm. mentally extracted and so this quick distraction this scroll meets with the resources I feel like I had. So can you talk about like the system and then also maybe some hope for Mm -hmm. people who, how do you get past that? Like where you feel like the systems are continuing to extract you. So you feel like you have no resources, no hope to get to that higher Mm -hmm. level. Like you were talking Mm -hmm. about, how do you break that cycle? Yeah. Ooh, I love that word that you've, you've landed on extraction. I mean, that's a powerful word. I think it is helpful, even if it is depressing, to realize that it actually is an entire system. It's not just because you're weak and you don't have what it takes. It's not just because your boss is demanding. It's not just because this device is around. It is an entire system of corporations, of internet service providers, of a culture of productivity, right? That is all just kind of pressing in to result in exactly what you're saying, right? We get to the end of the day and we've got nothing left. We're just done. And so I do think it's helpful and empowering to realize, oh, I'm actually up against this big thing. And then to start thinking, okay, well, how can I push back against this? Um, how can I square out, box out some kind of sacred space, sacred time that Mm -hmm. is going to be a source of life for me that will give me genuine rest after a day like this, um, but also reignite my imagination so that I can start to re-see what I am trying to do when I'm putting bread on the table or spending time Mm. with my kids or doing whatever, you know, going to school, right? Re-see it in such a way that it's not just, um, I call it a tyranny, right? A tyranny of the digital where you're just being kind of whipped and, and, you know, kind of driven. Like Mm -hmm. I'm just driven by my calendar. I'm driven by these alarms that are going off telling me I got to go to my next thing. God forbid your notifications. God (laughs) forbid your notifications. Exactly. I just think, you know, this is where being a person of faith, being someone who has resources within the Christian heritage is actually super exciting Mm -hmm. because Christianity is a faith that has a theology and has a whole history of spiritual disciplines and practices that is all about this. Mm -hmm. It's like we have a theology of rest. We have a theology of embodiment. We have have all these practices that are about stillness and solitude and silence Mm -hmm. that are meant to recenter you, um, Mm -hmm. that we just need to learn more about and read more about and kind of hang out with the desert fathers and desert mothers and be like, what were they doing in the desert? You know, Mm -hmm. praying and being in solitude. What were those hermits actually trying to do? Mm -hmm. Um, I just think there's a lot of exciting resources there for us to, to start learning from. Yeah. And just to follow that question up, because I think that was really good. At least personally in my experience in, in conversations that I've had with others, you know, you say, hey, there's a different way and we can we can disconnect, like you said, center. And I think one word that you used in, in the book was abide. Mm. And so there's an ability to do that. There's a theology for that, for the believer. But then often what's met with that when you say, hey, you can do this and it's okay and it, it will take time and it'll take work, but you can. Immediately what comes to mind is either the feeling of, uh, frustration towards my devices and towards even the practice of getting away from my devices or fear because it's like, well, this is how I'm connected to the world. Mm. And I don't know how to be connected to the world 
any other way. If I'm not on my phone, if I don't have some mm-hmm. social media, if I'm not texting, if I'm not emailing, if I don't have something, then I'm I'm no longer connected. And so that that draws up either frustration or fear. So what would you encourage that person who who has that desire to want to have that balance of being able to engage with technology and the digital, but also have a a balance of um of just being, you know, abiding with the Lord or just, or even if it's just being peaceful yeah. on the inside, how would you yeah. encourage that person as they encounter that fear or that frustration? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing I would say to that person is the fear is for real, <laughs> right? Like that's legitimate. Yeah. You know, we mm-hmm. live in a, in a situation where, So much of our social lives, our work lives, our family lives are enmeshed in the digital, right? So that fear of like, well, what would it mean to step away from that? Because that would threaten the social and the, and the work and the family. That's, that's a for real thing, you know, so that's a legitimate fear. Um, And the frustration is also legitimate, right? Like that's all very understandable reaction. I would also then encourage that person to think about what very small micro adjustments you can start taking that are actually experiments. Um, and this is what I like to do with my students um, who, who totally are frustrated and afraid, right? Mm-hmm. When we talk about these <laughs> things, I say, hey, let's just try a few things. Of course, they're my students, so I give them assignments, so I'm coercing them to do these experiments, (laughs) right? Um, But these experiments are are just, it's sort of like, hey, just try this thing, you know? And and in my class, there's this point in the semester that everyone knows when it's happening. It's that, and I could see it in my students' eyes, you know, it's like too many papers, too many extracurriculars, not enough sleep. Everyone's just kind of like, ah, and, and like the end of the semester is too far away to start hoping. Right. Mm-hmm. And everyone's just like, ah, I cannot. I say, Hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take 15 minutes today. And then we happen, I have happened to live and work at a place that's chronically beautiful and perfect in weather. <laughs> so we can do this. California. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit yeah. that <laughs> where I can say to them, Hey, you know, we're going to not do class for 15 minutes. You're going to go out. You're going to find a patch of grass. You're going to go find a tree. You're going to find a bush to lay under, whatever it is, right? <laughs> whatever it is, you're going to take 15 minutes. I just want you, and I, I do send them out with a couple prompts, you know, like, what is it that's like totally distracting me? Um, what's all the noise that's filling me now? What do I wish I could be doing? you know, write it down, 15 minutes, they come back. And it's like, that look in their eye is like gone for those 15 Mm. minutes after those 15 Mm. minutes. And there's a lot of sadness when they come back, actually, because there's, you know, they've thought about things that they Mm. haven't thought about. (laughs) um, Because they've been on the go, you know, Mm. but what I tell them is, hey, you just moved from one place to another in 15 minutes. That was just 15 minutes. I'm not asking you for two hours a day, you know, which is what we often think. We think like, I got to go run five miles and like detox and put my phone away for a weekend. Like, no, 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 no. Like just stop for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, maybe even, you know, for some of us, maybe we live lives where it's five, you know, where it's just like, I'm just going to take five minutes. I'm going to put the phone away. I'm just going to be quiet for five minutes. And we experiment. We find out, like, what, would it, what, what happens during that time? Maybe it's when we're driving hmm. and we're, like, in that in-middle commute time, right? We're, like, I'm just going to turn off the music, turn off this awesome podcast, and I'm just going to be quiet. I don't do that often enough, but it's – you feel that when you – like – yeah. So I mean, I'm always listen. I listen to music, but I'm mm-hmm. always cranking podcasts or audiobooks. But every now and then, like, yeah. I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna take a second. I'm gonna yeah. take a minute or two. Yeah, turn it off, right. and it's 
like you do f- it doesn't take yeah. long like we are so enmeshed even yeah. when we're trying to be like resourceful in how we use it we're so yeah. enmeshed like you feel that in like a couple of minutes of just yeah no nothing blaring at your face mm-hmm. out of the speakers you just go you just feel a little refreshed and yeah. you feel like you're doing something noble as well because it's like <laughs> if you're if you're listening to a podcast or listening to a book, yeah. especially if it's informative, it's like, no, this is not a bad thing because I'm no. learning and I'm, you know, yeah. in engaging with information. I'm becoming, you know, smarter in this moment mm-hmm. from, you know, work to home. So it's, you know, it's it it's almost seen as a an intrinsic good. And, yeah. and again, it's not to dismiss that as a particular no. reality. That might be true, yeah. but it's also seeing the value in being still. Yeah. Well, I, we just weren't built to live this way. I mean, we weren't mm. built yeah. to constantly be filling our minds and our spirits with stimulation. Mm-hmm. This is not like our brains weren't meant to do this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you talk about that at the beginning, like how how it is actually affecting our brains in ways that even like the people who spend their whole lives researching this, like th- we're still in the early stages. Like we don't really know how yeah, we don't our know. brains are being reshaped. Yeah. 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 We should care about that a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, I think it's, it is hard to experiment and to be intentional, you know, about these, mm-hmm. these things. So this is where I think the collective the idea of moving away from an individualized imagination to to remembering that we are relational and that we do live within community and that things get done within community in ways that are much more transformational than even the individual right mm-hmm. where where if we're going to start experimenting hey can we find a friend right who is feeling yeah. the same way where we can hit, say like Hey, you know, maybe you've had that conversation with that person before where you're like, this life is insane. Like, we're all just feeling so crazy, right? Mm -hmm. We get with that friend and we're just like, hey, how about let's do this? You know, like, let's just try this experiment together and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And it might even be like, hey, you know, um, instead of texting each other, let's just try just for this couple days, what would it be like if we actually dialed the phone and right? Like clicked, like, we're just going to actually hear each other's voices, you know, just for, let's just see what happens. You know, we're not committing to some long-term 30 day plan. We're not, you know, let's, let's just see what happens. And for me, the experiments, the experiment model is attractive because I kind of buy the the idea that as human beings, we are creatures of appetite. And when we taste something that is genuinely good, actually, mm. right, that is mm-hmm. deeply satisfying, not merely alluring, but it is actually satisfying that we will want to come again, right? Yes. Yeah. We will want more. Um, and that that will take intention. Mm. We don't have to trick ourselves into it. Yeah. It will take intention and it will help to have friends come along that are doing it too. But when we taste enough of what is genuinely satisfying, of genuine communion, genuine rest, then we will start to know how to build our lives, right? Given what they are, to be like, okay, well, Now I'm going to start building this deeper habit, you know, um, it's not just the five minute or the 15 minute occasionally, but like, Hey, you know, like what? So one example for me during the pandemic, like I, before the pandemic, I couldn't keep a plant alive in my house. Like everything died. (laughs) Okay. I was always like, I am the black thumb. Like, do not bring a plant close to me because I'm going to kill it. But what I realized during the pandemic was when all the kids were in the house, we're all working in the house, I was going crazy, you know, because I was just like, I, I can't, I'm a pretty like introverted solitude type of person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I realized I needed to get out of the house and I started gardening. And it was mm-hmm. really cool because there was a group of people that were gardening at the college. The, gar- the college had a plot that needed tending. And so I started gardening 
And um, I realized how satisfying it was, you know, just to get my hands in the soil, um, Mm -hmm. to be grounded in something that wasn't the screen. And once it was satisfying, I was like, all right, I'm committing to this. Like, this is good. Like, this is good stuff. Um, I want to keep doing this. And so I was like, all right, give me a row. I'm committing to it. I'm going to, you know, tend to it. I'm going to weep. I'm, gonna, I'm all in. Um, but that was just because in the beginning, I just started experimenting with it. I was like, all right, I'll go, I'll go with my friends and see if I want to garden. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know anything about gardening. Um, but it was just so deeply satisfying. And, and so I just think it's, it's like that for all of us, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. And I think the, the way you put it together as an experiment really puts it rather than a 30 day plan or whatever, because if it's a plan or if it's a regimen, then it allows us to measure it with, with <laughs> success or failure. Yes. It, we either did it well and we succeeded or we didn't do it well and we failed. And then, you know, all the guilt and the shame comes with that. But it's just like, hey, try it out. And there's mm-hmm. no necessarily, there's no metric. It, yep. Either it worked for you or it didn't. And that's not success or failure. You just tried. Yeah. And I think that can be incredibly liberating mm-hmm. for a lot of people um, because I think, you know, in our jobs, in almost everything we do, we are measuring things by mm-hmm. whether we succeeded or whether we failed at it. And, yeah. you know, there might be some environments where that's okay. Um, or he- if, if done well can be healthy. But um, in, in, in ways of kind of shaping ourselves at, mm-hmm. to grow more as individuals who are thoughtful, who contemplate, who are, uh, like you said, centered um, I think that that really gives some freedom to a lot of people to say, hey, mm-hmm. you're not being held to an obligation. Mm-hmm. Just ask you to try. And that's yeah. and, and and if you're good with the trying and it like you said, it's satisfying. Keep doing it. Mm-hmm. And if not, do you try something else and that's see if right. that works? Mm-hmm. And I think that that definitely is is a very liberating point for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love how much hope is there. Like, I was going to ask you at the end, like, what kind of encouragement might you have for a listener who feels like stuck or mm-hmm. isolated now with the pandemic? And I mean, yeah. just try something with grace for yourself. Is I mean, mm-hmm. do you have anything beyond that? Yeah, but I mean, I love much hope for our for our listeners. Yeah, other than call, we're going to put that in the show notes and listeners. Uh, email us or give us a voicemail of how that goes when you actually call people. It, it is the year of the voicemail, so this is perfect. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think there are um, these small experiments like, you know, if you're someone that goes to bed with the phone next to you or even under your pillow, what would it be like to put it on the other side of the room or even in a different room? Hmm. Like just to find out, you know, um, <laughs> when you wake up and when you go to bed, like if that changes your sleep, you know, I have my students do this and a lot of them are like, whoa, like this was really different. Right. Um, hmm. and then we have conversations about getting an analog alarm clock. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. um, but I think, you know, again, this is the sort of like encouraging ourselves to recognize our bodily like our embodied selves, right? And, and you talked about place earlier, right? That, that space and place actually do matter. You know, like my family, our phones are on the opposite side of the house when we charge them up at night because that actually gives me a lot of freedom when I'm going to bed. I'm kind of like, well, the phone's over there. Like, I don't know what's going to happen if it rings, like, you know, whatever, it's, it's over there. Um, I'm not going to keep checking it. I tend to think about sacred spaces and sacred places uh, sorry, sacred times and sacred places. So I think about how, you know, for some of us, we're morning people. And so if you're a morning person, then block, you know, protect that first 10 minutes when you wake up in the morning, right? Protect it with smelling the coffee, looking outside, maybe walking mm-hmm. outside if you're someplace where it's warm enough to walk outside. <laughs> or, cold enough. or actually, you know, looking at your kids, you know, like actually looking at them, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, or if you're a night person, right, um, turning off the phone 
and just being like the last 15 minutes of my wakefulness, I'm, I'm just not going to be on my phone. I'm going to read something. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play music. You know, I'm going to journal, whatever it is. I think there are these, these small things that, that we can do to create sacred places and sacred mm-hmm. times that we can start to treasure. You know, like when you start sure. doing the experiment enough, then you actually start being protective about yeah. that time or that place, mm-hmm. um, which I think can be really cool. Yeah. And I think I want to encourage people as well, because I've tried this and you can tell the addictions there because as soon as I set the phone down to pick the book up, my, my brain is saying, pick your phone up. Go get it. Go get it. There's a notification. I hear the, zzz, zzz, and I'm like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta pick it up. And so I can't, it, it's almost sometimes where I can't even focus for five minutes. So mm-hmm. it's an encouragement to say, it's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. It is going to be tough because we have curated our entire lives and existence around technology. Mm-hmm. And so to do something, which I think it's fair to say countercultural, mm-hmm. it's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. But again, there is another side where it's valuable. So go through mm-hmm. that toughness mm-hmm. in order to get the value of satisfaction on the other side. So I just wanted to qualify that because it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, people can hear this and be like, oh, okay, I can put my phone yeah, down yeah. for five minutes yeah. or 10 minutes yeah. and go ahead and, and read a book or something like that. Like you said, smell the coffee, look at the kids. But then you start doing that and you feel <laughs> that aching, yes. that itching, like, oh, yeah. oh, I don't have my phone on me. Like, I'm, I, I think I'm naked or something. You know what I mean? Because it's just yeah. like I've, I'm so tethered to it. Yeah. So it, there will be a challenge. Yeah. But I think there still is value. And so if, if a person knows there's, there is value on the other side, you just kind of have to labor. Yeah. to 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 yes. to get that satisfaction yeah. then that that prompts them well to know that it's not just a flip of the switch and you have this idea do the experiment and it'll just take but it's no, no. it's going to take a, a bit of work and that's yeah. okay that's expected mm-hmm. but keep pushing i always get uh, tripped out whenever i do that and like you you know it's kind of like an addictive problem when you get those like phantom notifications like my phone's not in my pocket but like i feel a buzz because i want to feel a buzz that's when it's crazy i was gonna say um i was kind of like half-heartedly trying to do that um at meal times but mm-hmm. in the last week or so listening to the book i have been more purposeful like sometimes like turning them off but sometimes like just getting them away from the table and it's i, I definitely have noticed more like uh mm-hmm. The, the place, like feeling more like in that place and in that space. And it's, it's simple, but like that, that is supposed to be a sacred time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think like if anyone out there has been an athlete, if you've been a musician, if you've ever trained or just honed a skill, mm-hmm. it's the same process, right? Mm-hmm. Like being an athlete, uh, training for something, being a musician, an artist, it, you get through the hard, there's hard stuff you got to get through, right? To, to be able to actually feel the liberation, right? Of mm-hmm. being able to run fast or jump far or play music, you know, improv, right? Like you've got to train on those things. And I think yeah. in many ways, you know, Vince, you talked about how we've curated our lives in a certain way. It's like we have been trained already by our devices. We have yeah. to untrain, right? We have to train mm-hmm. towards um a different way um because we're just we we are living an extracted life um, yeah. as trevor put it and that, that's just not sustainable yes. yeah and and honestly it, it it's not on i think we think it's foreign sometimes but it's it's actually pretty common the practice itself because it's like even when you start a job you probably mm-hmm. suck at that job <laughs> for a while and then you learn how to do that job well. And then once you do the job well, you, mm-hmm. you know, you skate mm-hmm. through it like, like it's second nature. And so it's almost approaching it in that same way. You're, you're probably going to stumble. You're probably going to fall a little bit. But in the same way that you know I have to get better at my job in order to keep it, I have to get better at this in order to keep my sanity. And mm-hmm. so I think yeah. that's, that's, that's a huge encouragement. And I think it's not as foreign as people think yeah. it's just putting your mind in the, in the right mm-hmm. framework. So that's, that's super encouraging. Wow. Wow. What an honor to have you on Felicia. This has been 
just a really enjoyable conversation. I think our listeners are going to have some great, great value in here and um, maybe they'll uh, pause the podcast for a little bit and then just enjoy, you know, 15 minutes of nature or yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thought or whatever else. I I used to listen to this podcast that would put like a 30 to 60 seconds of silence at the end of the podcast, which I also found to be Mm. one of my favorite parts of the podcast. It's just like reflecting over everything I just listened to and like processing it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but come back out. for the shout yeah. outs after you pause it for the. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. This episode of The Substance is brought to you by Chris Hotchkiss, American Family. Even though we don't know what life has in store for our homes or cars, we can still be prepared. Introducing the damage doesn't have to be too damaging policy from American Family Insurance. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Contact Chris Hotchkiss Agency in Overland Park, Kansas at 913-268-8200 today. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, SI, and its operating companies, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Chris is a friend of mine. He's a good guy. When I bought my house here in Kansas City, he was the person I called for my American Family quote. And if you're a listener here in the Kansas City area and you're looking for a quote, or a second opinion, Chris is a great guy to call. Check out his information in the show notes for his phone number or website. We do this segment on our show. It's our it's our only uh, segment we really do called Substantive Shoutouts. And the idea of Substance Shoutouts is just anything that you've been enjoying, whether it's in media of any, fu- any kind, books, music, uh, um, but it could be anything. It could be um, a show you've watched or... Um, something uh, a thing that you went to any anything like that so um what's what's uh something that you've been enjoying lately lately that you'd like to shout out um so yeah i i i listen to podcasts uh pretty regularly and one that's been especially kind of meaningful recently is i I listened to on being by krista with krista tippett and um she's recently been doing a couple um, actually replaying some older interviews that she had done with um, people that have recently passed away. Uh, mm. Desmond Tutu, mm. if not Han. Um, and it's just, just listening to these interviews um, with these two gentlemen um, has just been, yeah, just really meaningful. Mm-hmm. I also just recently, you know, I listened to Pass the Mic with Jamar Tisby um, on and off. and. Yeah. And I just recently uh, listened to uh, Jamar Tisby's episode on When God Seems Distant, where he talks about his own spiritual uh, life uh, recently. Mm. And and I just found that to be uh, such a blessing, such a gift um, to hear someone be super honest about how challenging it is to be a person of faith right now um, when you're... Mm. um, Seeing what's going on in the world, um, yeah. and have a lot of questions about what's going on in the church. I just, yeah, I was just really, really um, blessed by. Uh, I don't know. I just found it freeing, actually, to hear him um, articulate a lot of things that I've been feeling myself. So, yeah, those are the two that come to mind. I, I'm someone who, um, you know, so I don't have my phone by my bed, um, and so I read children's literature. Um, oh, when nice. I go to bed, that's the, that's the sign of light stuff. Um, so mm-hmm. I've been, I've been plowing through the, uh, Enola Holmes series, nice. which is kind of fun, um, stuff. So I'll give that a shout out just cause it's fun stuff. Awesome. Love that. Where can people find you, um, online? Um, so they can, uh, be following you and as well as, uh, engaging with the content you have. Yeah, so I have a personal website. It's called FeliciaWooSong.com. Um, mm-hmm. And there you have kind of all the things I've been doing and, and writing on. Um, if you want to find me through Westmont College, because I teach there, that's another way to um, find me and get in touch with me. Awesome. Excellent. Well, once again, Felicia, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast, thinking through these issues with us and It's been a ministry to us, I know, and I know it's a ministry to our listeners as well. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been really fun to be with you all. Good. That was really encouraging. Thanks for your time, Felicia. Well, have a great evening.
Well, guys, what a what a terrific conversation. I feel refreshed. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. very encouraging. Man, I'm already thinking of some experiments that I can kind of try a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm this would be a good one. listeners get some experimentation and let us know how it goes. Absolutely. Yeah, and do and and do it with someone. It's always encouraging. Same way where you grab somebody to go to the gym together or, you know, do anything together. Um, I think there's value in making sure you don't do it alone. So grab somebody to join you with that. Super low stakes. You don't need to commit to a month long, a year long, whatever. Just see what works. Do it for a couple of days. Love it. Thank you for listening uh, to this episode here. We had a wonderful time talking with Felicia. If that was something that was encouraging, edifying, or of value to you, we'd like to invite you to uh, join us in um, becoming a a listener supporter of the show. Uh, The primary way you can do that monthly is in the anchor link in the show notes. You can sign up at the $5 or $10 a month. Uh, limit right now there's no extra features because we are we're working hard to produce a a great show for you guys each week Mm -hmm. um but you're helping us grow we now have a website because of you guys thank you and um we are working we we want it to be excellent merch will be coming at some point but uh we're the listener support is helping us do these things and if that's something you're able to do We'd greatly appreciate that. And if you want to support us, throw us a little bit here and there. And monthly support is not something you can do or you don't want to do. Um, you can hit us on Cash App at dollar sign the substance pod. You're going to give us five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever. Say, hey, appreciate what you guys do. Really love that episode. Here's a little bit. That's how you can do that there. Absolutely. And look at, look at your timestamp right now, wherever you're at, go ahead and whatever podcast you're listening to, go to the substance.com and finish listening to this episode at that timestamp. Uh, just click on the episode at the substance, uh, pod.com and there you will be able to comment. So as soon as this episode is over, Tell us what you thought about it, any experiments <laughs> that you tried, um, and you could just let us know in the comments section what you thought about this particular episode and how it helped or, you know, any any other results that came from, from your trying. Um, we also have our social links in the upper right corner of the homepage, so definitely give us a follow at The Substance Pod and engage with us on the socials as well as thesubstancepod.com. I thought you were going to say, look at the timestamp and hit us on Cash App. It's like 70 bucks. This is minute 70. <laughs> if you want to hit us with 70 bucks, we will take it with gratitude and we will be, we will just be yeah. overjoyed. I was Ooh, like, oh yeah. man. <laughs> we'll shout you out personally for that one. <laughs> for sure. That, that would be pretty dope. And as um, you may have heard earlier in the episode, and Dr. Song confirmed it with us, right? Like 2022. Mm-hmm. Till you're about okay, to say, I thought you were going somewhere else. <laughs> no, go for you're it. The voicemail. It's the year of the voicemail. And yes, sir. Um, yeah, you know, in a time when we're talking about like hearing people's voices and we've already got some good ones. Keep them coming, guys. We I would love to have like too many voicemails where it's like we we have to like we have to like start saying no to some of these voicemails. I'd yeah, love to blow have that our problem. line up. We yeah, got yeah, that yeah. for y'all. Blow it up. What what about that as an experiment? Like you call you listen with this. your real voice. You, you 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 pick up your phone and you Tell use the actual dial too, by the way. Yeah, that's Tell us a great what place idea. you're calling from. That's yeah. Do that. The number to do all of these wonderful, very embodied old school <laughs> things is 913-703-3883. Boom. Leave us a line there. You can also send us an email at substancepod at gmail.com. We love that too. Appreciate mm-hmm. everybody sending us emails there. We will answer those eventually. We do read them all pretty much right away. So we thank you for that. We thank you for hanging out with us. My name's Trevor. And I'm Philip. And I'm Vincent. And we're looking forking forward to seeing you next time on The Substance. We gone.